Well, the struggle is real. That's what our series is. And as I was thinking about the struggles that we go through, people can be a struggle, can't they? Can't people just sometimes make you crazy? You you know who I'm talking about, right? You don't have to point at them. You don't have to make them stand up. But there are people around you that absolutely make you crazy. People that have the personality or the, their, their demeanor that when they walk on the room or when they come into the office, you're saying, oh, man, it's going to be a long day. Why can't they just call in sick or why are they here? <laughs> let, me, let me give you a few of them. A few of them. And, and in your, don't write it down and don't point at them, please. But in your outline, you could put their name right beside it because each one of these, they have the characteristics. The first one is the demanding the demanding. He is the, the little dictator, controlling, dominating. When he walks into the room, everything changes to what he wants to do. He is the demanding individual. And then you have the disapproving, the nitpicker, the negative, or the perfectionist. He's so disapproving. Whatever you do, he or she would do it better. Whatever you say, they will say it better. They are a nitpicker in what you do. They're negative and they never give you compliments. They're disapproving. And then the deafening, the loud. I call them the megaphoners of life. They're mouthy. They're opinionated. When they're on Facebook, it's their opinion that matters. And if you disagree, you will hear about it. Somebody give me an amen on that one. Okay, destructive. Destructive. They're volcanoes. They're angry. They have a flaring temper. You have to walk around with eggshells like, like you're on eggshells, never knowing what's going to take place or when the volcano will erupt. They are destructive. And then the disconnected. <laughs> Call them the crybabies. <laughs> Chronic complainers. Fault finders. They're whiners. Everything is against them. Everybody is out to hurt them. And nobody loves them. They are disconnected, and they are disconnected in their life. And then the demeaning, demeaning. They are smart mouths, rude, often makes fun of people. They are the bubble bursters of life. They are demeaning. When they look at you, they think they're talking to you, but they slam you or they make fun of you. And sometimes those things hurt. So when you think about these types of individuals, what do you do with somebody that just makes you crazy. You've listed some names, or if you didn't list their names, you at least put them in your head. There's six steps of how to deal with these crazies in your life. But here's the deal. As we go, each step gets harder and harder as we go. So I, you, you say, well, I can deal with the one, or I can deal with two. But when we get down to point five or six, it is going to get hard. But the first one, if you can't get past the very first one, you're going to have a hard time with the rest of them. And here it is. Don't be offended. That's hard, isn't it? Don't be offended. How can you not be offended? They're revealing who they are, not who you are. When they, whatever they are, whoever makes you crazy... Whatever they come up with, they're speaking more about their life than your life. There are plenty of people that are offended about a lot of different things. But the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16, A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. We need to develop a thicker skin. Get a more tender heart and a thicker skin. Because people are saying things, and here's the deal. They don't know they are hurting your feelings. They do not know they are, and they don't care that they are. Sometimes they are just speaking about who they are. How can we do this? They look past their behavior. We need to look past their behavior and into their pain. Most people that have a demeanor that's negative or critical, they are speaking out of their pain. Here's a phrase that every counselor wants you to know. Hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. When they are struggling in their life, when they're pain, 
when, when they're going through bankruptcy or when they're going through a marital struggle or when they're going through kids' issues or when they had problems growing up in their past and they haven't dealt with it, they are understanding they hurt and they don't know how to deal with their emotions. So when they hurt you, most of the times they are telling you that they are hurting themselves. Sometimes we need to ask, did they have a childhood that made them that way? Did they fight with their spouse today? Did they struggle financially today? Why did they wake up on the wrong side of the bed today? In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking their wrongs. Sensible people control their anger. I was always told this. In the midst of a fight, the one that will win is the one that can control. Well, that doesn't get mad. That doesn't blow up. That when somebody is yelling and arguing and fighting with them, to learn not to take it personal and take a step back. So don't take offense to it and don't take it personal. These people that make you crazy, we have to first and foremost say, you know what? They're not talking to me. What they say to me is not going to affect me. I'm not going to allow it to affect me. How many of you guys have ever been posted on Facebook? Somebody, somebody said something about you on Facebook. You have two decisions to make. Well, let me get back at them. I don't know if they're really talking about me. They really didn't mention me by name, but they said a lot of things that it could be me, but I think I'm just going to write them a post back and send it and let everybody have my side of the story. When we do that, what we're doing is we just jumped into their game. We need to not be offended and not be insulted. The second thing that we have to do is don't wait for an apology to forgive them. Uh oh. Well, if they apologize, I will forgive. No. Don't wait for the apology. Apology is a spiritual matter. Apology is grace. Now, trust, that takes some time. But apologies, crazy people don't recognize they're crazy. <laughs> they don't. Amen. Amen. They aren't upset about what they just did. They don't even know they did something wrong. They're probably responding in their pain. And if you expect them to apologize because they said something out of their demeanor, they're never going to apologize. They said it and they dropped it and they walked away from it and you're sitting there holding the bag and you're saying, if they come back and apologize, I will forgive them. What we need to do is we just need to drop it and forgive Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said to them, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Sometimes people do things to us and for us that they don't even know what they're doing, and we have to forgive. Forgiveness is a spiritual act. Forgiveness is not a physical fact. If I cannot forgive, what I am going to do is I'm going to turn that bitterness, that anger inside of my life, it's going to control me. I may not trust you, but I can forgive you. I used this illustration uh, three weeks ago, and Mark got a lot of phone calls on this, but uh, when a husband and a wife get in a fight, and uh, Mark's been drinking a lot lately, and, and uh, <laughs> Mark, uh, his wife came home, and uh, Mark hit her right upside the face, gave her a big old black eye. And uh, Debbie was saying, well, what was that for? I said, I don't know, I just had a bad day. And Debbie says, get out of my house. Get, get out of here. Okay, Mark left a little bit, and then Mark sobers up, as he does every other night, sobers up. <laughs> he's one of my deacons, so he's taking this joke very well. He sobers up and he says, he says honey, can, can I come back into the house? Will you forgive me? And she says, yes, I will forgive you. But no, you can't come back. I thought you forgave me. I do forgive you. But I do not trust you. Trust is something that is earned. Forgiveness is instantaneous. But trust takes time. It takes time. 
If you want to do this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, is probably one of the best scriptures. If you, if you had a scripture on your dashboard that you would drive and you would read every day to work, Colossians 3, verse 13, would change your life. You ready for it? It says this, Bear with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. Woo! I don't like that last word, must. If somebody has an ought against you, we must forgive somebody. We must not let it control us. And when we do that, what forgiveness is, is forgiveness is, I am not going to hold you accountable. I'm not going to act like you did this. I'm going to love you in spite of this. But I'm not going to trust you in this. It's going to take time. What we have to do as an apology, I'm going to forgive you. Now, I may not trust you, but I am going to forgive you. And then, okay, this is a Baptist church, right? Third one, don't gossip about it. Oh, you know what? That is the Christian sin that nobody talks about, right? I could talk about drinking, smoking, and gambling, and everybody's like, yeah! You talk about gossip? No, we better not do that. Don't gossip about it. It proves your need of affection for someone else that they believe that they are crazy too. You just, let me tell you what she said. Let me tell you what he just did. Gossip. When we gossip, we are giving them the authority over our lives. In Proverbs 17, 9, love prospers when the fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Whew. Let's read that again. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Don't gossip about it. Let me tell you the definition of gossip. Talking about someone to someone else who neither provides a solution or is part of the problem of the person you're talking about. If they are not involved with it or they can't help you fix it, shut up about it. That's the bottom line. Gossip hurts. It does not help. And when somebody makes you crazy and they're coming in and they're just causing havoc within your life, we just can't, as a Christian, gossip about what other people are saying. 1 Peter 3, 9, this scripture here. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do and will be granted the greatest blessing. So don't repay evil for evil. Repay evil with good. And then God can bless you because what you have done for them. Now it gets harder. Number four, don't play their games. Crazy people like to argue and debate. They like the attention. They like it whether it's positive or negative. The problem with arguing with crazies is they don't even arri arrive in the decision logically. They have to do it out of emotion. So however they feel that day, they can go off. They may be perfect this morning, but mad this afternoon. And it wasn't anything that you did, but you're the first one there. So you say something or you hear something. Jesus didn't play the game. When you're playing games with crazies, when you have somebody at work that just says something or does something that just drives you crazy, we have to learn how to just ignore it. We forgive it if they say something bad. Don't take it personal. It clearly, don't play their games. Jesus had some games played with him. The Pharisees were trying to play some games with him. They said, they said here's a coin. What do you do with this coin? In Matthew chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, it says, But Jesus knew their evil motives. And he said, you hypocrites. He said, why were we trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. When they handed him the Roman coin, he said, pay unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, and pay unto God what is God. But he said, why are you trying to trap me? In other words, why are you trying to play this game? Paul said the same thing when he was writing his church in, in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest will know this. We tell the truth at all costs. When we tell the truth at all costs, we don't play games. 
We don't play the games. Now, what types of games do people play? Well, we call it the army game. They want to build their army. They want you to be on their side. You have an office space of maybe 30 or 40 people, and you have somebody that, that is trying to be demanding, and they try to build their army. So if something would take place, well, I have five people that said that, or I have 15 people to say that, or I have a bunch of people that's telling me this. Don't play their game. Just say, you know what? If I have a problem with somebody, I'll talk to that person myself. I'm not going to play your game. How you also play that game is... I think Facebook can be a good thing, but also Facebook is of the devil. I guarantee you. Here's why. It's very easy to say things when you're not looking at somebody. And it's very easy to get angry at what you read because you think they may be talking about you. And it's very easy at 1 o'clock at night when you're up and you can't sleep and you're in a bad mood anyway to start posting. And then you look at 9 o'clock in the morning and say, ooh, why did I say that? Or you read the comments about what somebody else said and you think it's about you. Facebook is a game player. And what we have to do is, in everything that we do, Paul said, we treat others with respect and honest and love. If we can treat others, whether it's face-to-face -face or whether it's in social media or whether it's through texting or email, treat People with respect. Whether they get on your nerves or not, it's not the case. Thomas Paine says this, To argue with a man who has renounced the use of authority and reason is like administering medicine to the dead or endeavoring to convert an atheist without scripture. You can't happen. In Proverbs chapter 26, verse 21, a quarrelsome person starts fights as easy as a hot embers lights coals in the fire lights wood. How many people does it take to fight? How many? It takes two people to fight. So what do you do? You walk away. As a Christian, our goal is not to be right. Our goal is to be respected. And in the fight of life when somebody is arguing somebody's making you crazy you can stand up and you can fight and you can defend and you can throw scriptures at them and you can win that argument but you lose the war our testimony is what we fight with our testimony with our scripture somebody wants to fight somebody wants to argue keep your testimony keep your testimony it's not worth don't play their games don't play their games and then here's the third, fifth one it gets harder don't cave in. Don't cave in. Don't allow them to manipulate your life. Christians think that they should always, they always should be the, the soft answer and, and walk away and not stand up. Forgiveness is by grace. Trust is by works. What we must do is Jesus was a very meek individual. Does meek mean weak? No. no. Here's, here's, let me give you the definition of meek. Meek is a, is, a, is a wild stallion that is unbroken. And that wild stallion is a magnificent animal. You look at him and he has the power and the authority. You look at him, he's bucking, his, his back feet go over his head, and he's just a gigantic, awesome, unbroken animal until David Eagle captures him. And then David Eagle takes him into his corral, and David Eagle breaks that wild animal now that wild animal is called meek. He is a broken animal ready to be used by his master. Does that animal have the power that it did before he was broken? Absolutely. But that power is now harnessed to be released when David says, go. That is the power of meekness. And that is what Jesus was. Jesus was meek and mild. He had the authority. He had the power. But that power was under control. Under control. We don't have to be weak. We need to be meek. And we be meek in order for God to use us. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 12 and 14. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you realize you're offending the Pharisees? 
about what you just said? Jesus replied, every plant not planted by the heavenly Father will be uprooted. And it says this, so ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind, but one blind person guides another, they will both fall into the ditch. In other words, if somebody is saying something that doesn't make any difference or if they are offending you, ignore them. Don't cave into them. Just ignore them. Even God couldn't please everybody. Jesus clearly didn't please everybody. Sometimes we have to just say, ignore them. The crazies in life are going to be around us wherever we go. Wherever we go. And the last one is always take the high ground. Always take the high ground. Whatever somebody says, whatever is said, always take the high ground. If they insult you, be kind. If they are unloving, love them. If they're resentful, be forgiving. If they're mean, be nice. That's what Christ would ask us to do. You cannot control how they speak to you, what they think of you, or what they do to you. But it's your choice how to respond, whether you're going to be kind, loving, and forgiving. Refuse to let someone make you the enemy. Refuse. Refuse. I am not allowing somebody that drives me crazy to control me and to control my actions. What I first and foremost have to do is I cannot take it personal. I love what we said earlier. We have to look past why they're saying it. To look at the pain of what took place within their life. You know, we have people around us in our offices and our school that, that we look at and say, man, they just drive me crazy. But you know what? If we would take the time and get into their life, we would probably find out why they drive us crazy. Sometimes they're just like us, and that makes us crazy. But sometimes they have major issues within their life, and the insecurity within their life is calling out and asking for somebody to come alongside them and minister to them. I want to finish with these three verses. And these three verses, if we could use these three verses, it would change the way that we look at others that drive us crazy. So when you have a problem, and when somebody's coming up and you say, ah, not today, not today, listen to these verses. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Well, we probably aren't being persecuted, so let's change that word persecute. Bless those that make you crazy. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. In other words, I'm going to love you in spite of what you do. Real love, real love is loving the unlovable, the unlovely, and the crazy. In Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 18, it says, Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can live in peace with everyone. As a Christian, we just have to love. We have to love in a way that we are respected in what we do. But when somebody drives you crazy, don't take it personal. Don't try to retaliate. Just forgive them and move on. Don't cave into their, their stuff and just act like they do not exist. Just ignore them. And then Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Conquer evil by doing good. What if someone in our lives drives us crazy? What should we do? Don't be offended. Wait for the apology. Don't wait for the apology. Gossip. Don't play their games and don't cave in. But always take the high ground. Always take the high ground. Now, let's talk about crazy. Do you know you drive somebody crazy? You can look at all the people, all the people that drive you crazy. And it's easy to look out there, but it's very difficult to look right here. And sometimes we have to be very self-aware of what we do to drive other people crazy. And sometimes it's what we say, and sometimes it's how we act, and sometimes it's the demeanor that we have. But as many people that drive us crazy, we drive others crazy. And that we have to realize that we have a calling upon our life, and the calling upon our life is to always point people to Jesus Christ. And we cannot be the barrier for Christ. 
We cannot say, well, I would, I would know Christ if it wasn't for, or I'd go to your church if it wasn't for. What we must always do is take the high road. We must always love people, care for people, and take care of people. But in Proverbs, or Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, when people's lives please the Lord, even their enemy are at peace with them. When your life is pleasing to the Lord, even your enemy will be pleased with you. What does that mean? That means our goal is when people drive you crazy, our focus has to be God. We can't look at their craziness. We can't look at their attitude. We have to say, Lord, he's having a bad day. Let us move on. The Bible is very clear on that, you know what? We have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to communicate the love and the forgiveness of Jesus at all costs. And if we do the love and the forgiveness of Jesus at all costs, even our enemies will respect us. And if our enemies respect us, it gives us an open door to share about Jesus. You know, this week is going to be a, uh, an awesome week. Let me tell you what takes place. We go up to camp and we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we get to share uh, a bunch of stuff to the kids. And then we do not have an invitation until Thursday night. And Thursday night, we hold that invitation because we don't want an invitation with emotion. We want invitation because of fact. We want our kids to know what's taking place within life. We want to talk to them about their decisions that they make. We want to talk to them about conquering. We're going to talk about David and Goliath and how he was thinking. We're going to talk about uh, Joseph and how he had to, to run because we had some, some decisions that he had to make. We're not going to get into the whole no, the whole thing, just that he had some decisions that he had to make and he ran. And there's times in our life that we cannot hang with somebody. We have to make decisions and leave. But Thursday night, we talk about the greatest conversation that we could ever have. And that conversation is about Jesus. And we are going to do what you do with your kids on that Thursday night. We're going to have kids that are from second grade all the way to sixth grade. And we're going to give them the very simple thing that changes their life. And that's the plan of salvation. And not only just the plan of salvation, give them an opportunity to talk about those things that they struggle with. A third grader, a fourth grader, a fifth grader, they struggle with a lot of things. You know, if we can imagine what it was like, if anybody ever been to, to Mexico, or, or even, let's go not even to Mexico, let's go to a carnival. A carnival where they have sideshows. And back in the day when we went to the carnival, the, 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 the people that ran the sideshows, they would be inside the building and they, hey, come in here, come in here, come in here. And you'd go in, you'd play a game, or you'd see what's going on in there. And you'd make a choice whether you went into the sideshow or not. Today, in our culture, you walk down that same corridor, there's sideshows on both sides, and they're not people inside the sideshows asking you to come in. They are now in the alleyway. They are showing them what's inside the sideshow. They are putting their arm around them, carrying them in, our culture today is different than what our culture was 20 years ago. Amen. Our kids, from second grade, first grade, all the way through high school, we cannot just say, man, I hope everything turns out good. No. In a very loving way. Not in a controlling way. But in a very loving way, we have to say, let me tell you what's in the sideshow. Let me tell you why you really don't need to go into that sideshow. And some of us can be honest and say, I was in that sideshow. Let me tell you what took place in my life because I went in that sideshow. And these kids have to learn, you know what? I can walk through life with blinders on and I do not have to try every sideshow. I don't have to go see everything. I know what's in that sideshow. And many of us have the opportunity to say to kids, to youth, don't do it. Let me tell you what that sideshow did to me for the last 15 years. Let me tell you what took place in my life and where I am now and where I could have been if I would have just stayed on that path, if I'd have never taken a left. But our kids, that sideshow, those freaks are pulling them in. What we must do is be able to teach them what's in there so they will not experience the things that we had to experience. And that's what Thursday night's all about. Thursday night, 
I hope is an eye-opening opportunity for our kids to have a passion and a love for Jesus and an awareness of what life is all about. It's an awesome responsibility.